uh, giving out the Word of God to you all Sunday night. And we appreciate that very, very much. Also, I want to remind all of the men of our Saturday night prayer meeting this coming Saturday night at 9 o'clock. Uh, if you can, be here. And uh, just very informally, we just come in, get on the altar and pray. And when you finish praying, just get up and, and go on back to the house. But I believe God honors that faithfulness in prayer. And I'd like to encourage all the men that can be here, be here at 9 o'clock Saturday night. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 6. I'm going to begin reading a, a, text, a, a context of Scripture, beginning in verse number 20. Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body more than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon, in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall He not much more clothe, ye, clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 33 will serve as our text message tonight, our thought for the message tonight. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I simply titled the message tonight, Putting First Things First. Our Father, in Jesus' name, thank You for the Word of God tonight. Thank You for the opportunity to gather together in Your name and worship You in spirit and in truth. Thank You for all that are in attendance. Lord, bless them for their faithfulness to come. We pray that they'll find the need of their heart met in the Word of God tonight. And dear Lord, for those that are unable to be here due to sickness, recoveries from surgery, what have you, Lord, bless and be with them and meet their needs tonight. And then, Father, I pray for those that could have been here but simply just chose not to for whatever reason. I pray that you'd deal with their heart tonight about the faithfulness, the duty of the child of God to be faithful to the house of God when the doors are open. You have your willing way tonight. I'm just a willing vessel. I ask you to fill me with your power and providence, your presence, Lord, to expound your word in a manner that is pleasing unto you, then that is your will for us tonight. I pray that you'd speak to the hearts of everybody, especially this preacher. And dear Lord, we, may we not just hear the word of God with our ears and believe the, the word of God academically, but may we believe it with the heart and practice it. In Jesus' name and for His sake, amen and amen. Now the Lord Jesus in this statement in verse number 33 that serves as our text tonight, the Lord Jesus is putting our life in its proper perspective. These to whom He is preaching, and this is part of the Sermon on the Mount, 
So he's preaching to a large crowd of people. And uh, he tells them that their lives, if they wish to serve God, if they wish to live happy lives, fulfilled lives, lives that please the Lord, then they need to live a life that puts first things first and lives in its proper perspective. The things that we find here in the last clause of this verse, and these things shall be added to you, of course they refer to the things that Jesus made mention of in the preceding verses. And they are all things of the flesh. They are things that people worry about. There are things that people wonder if they're going to come or not. Food, drink, clothes. How we're going to dress. How will we cover ourselves? What will we eat? What will we drink? And I think in our modern day, not adding to the Scriptures at all, but simply saying that many people worry about, well, where are we going to pay our bills? How are we going to pay our bills? And how are we going to buy groceries? And how are we going to do this? And how are we going to do that? And... The Lord Jesus basically told us that we're really wasting our time with all of that worry. Because He said to them in verse number 32, Your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. Don't you think that an all-seeing God sees that bill from the power company laying on your kitchen counter? and it's more than you thought it was going to be, and you're wondering where the money's going to come from, have you ever considered that's no problem for God? He owns everything. How can a bill scare a God that owns everything? We look inside of our cupboards or look inside of our refrigerators, and, and they may be bare or nearly bare, and we think, how, we, how are we going to feed the family? Where will we get food from? Well, don't you think that an all-seeing and all-knowing God sees inside of your cupboards? He sees inside of your refrigerator. The Bible plainly tells us that. That's why I said we must not just believe the Word of God academically. We must believe the the, the, the Word of God spiritually and practice the Word of God. And when it says that we're not to fret, that we're not to worry, because our Heavenly Father knows what we have need of, that should bring a great bit of comfort to our heart. God never told us that we have to to determine where our blessings are going to come from. We know they're going to come from God. We don't know how. So many times the Lord doesn't share the how with us. How is this going to work out? How is this going to happen? And we don't have the answer, but God does. Now we like that part. We like that confidence. Amen? We like to know that God is going to meet our needs. But the Lord Jesus says, I don't want you to forget something. He says that confidence comes, that assurance comes only to a select group of people. And it is the people that seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness first. That's what the Scripture says. The Scripture says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. It doesn't say if we worry ourselves to death, all things shall be added unto you. It doesn't say that if we try to mastermind the situation and work things out on our own that God will honor our effort and He'll add all things to you. No, that's not what the book says. The book says to seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. In the book of Joshua, in the third chapter, Children of Israel are passing into the promised land. After 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. And I want to read to you a portion of Scripture from the book of Joshua, chapter number 3, 
that I believe is a good illustration of what the Lord Jesus is trying to expound to those that are sitting there and listening to the Sermon on the Mount. The Bible says in Joshua chapter 3 and verse 1, And Joshua rose early in the morning, and they removed from Shittim and came to Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. Now, I want you to pay particular attention to verse number 3 and verse number 4. Verse 2, And it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host. Now look at verse 3. And they commanded, now these are the officers, they commanded the people, saying, When ye see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then ye shall remove from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that ye may know by the way by which ye must go. For ye have not passed this way heretofore. And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Now, the Bible tells us here that back in the Old Testament day that the Ark of the Covenant, that box, you can find its dimensions given in the Law of Moses, and uh, that lid, which is called the mercy seat that has the two cherubs, that Ark of the Covenant always represents the presence of God. And the reason it does is because God told Moses that that is where he would meet with him and with the people. It was between the wings of the cherub. And so what Joshua is saying is as we are crossing over this river Jordan, you keep a space between you and the ark. Not that God doesn't want you to be close to him, but that God wants you to be able to be in a position where you can always keep your eye upon the Ark of the Covenant and whichever way it goes, right, left, or straight, you go after it. You follow after it. That is your priority. That is your goal, is to follow the presence of God. And he said, if you'll do that, he says, the Lord will do wonders among you. Now back to the words of Christ. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. So we're to keep our eyes on Jesus and to seek Him and the righteousness of God first. And if we follow Him we can't go wrong. Now, there are many people who put other things first. There may be something on this list that perhaps you're putting first. And perhaps you may not realize that you're putting it first. But if you are, then that's not the will of God for you. Many people put business first. They give all they have to the, and to the work that they do uh, in the public sector. Well, I believe it's good to work hard. I believe a Christian ought to be the best employee on the payroll. I believe they should have the best work ethic. I believe they should be honest and upfront and do the best job that a boss could ever expect anyone to do. But we don't put business first. We don't put our job first. How could we be so arrogant to seek a job first when we know that we could lose that thing tomorrow. It's very fleeting. It's very temporal. Some people, they don't put their jobs or their business first, but some put the accumulation of wealth first. I've got to build my nest egg. I've got to have something to, to live on. And it's, it's, even, it's, it's emphasized even more in this modern day where many, many employers no longer offer a pension for its employees. 
And if an employee is going to retire someday and live on something other than just the Social Security check, they're going to have to put forth the effort to save it themselves. And so many put the accumulation of their wealth at the forefront of their life. But we don't put faith. We don't put wealth and accumulation of wealth first. Oh, everybody wants a nest egg, but we don't put that first. Why? Because that's as fleeting as a job. That could be gone tomorrow. Many put convenience and ease of living first. Many put their pleasures first. I'm going to have a good time. I deserve it. Don't you hate that word deserve? Some put their politics first. Some put their country first. There's nothing wrong with being a patriot, but we don't put our country above seeking God and His righteousness, you see. What does it mean, actually? What does it mean to seek first the kingdom of God? We read it, but do we understand it? Well, I think it means, first of all, to conform our life to its principles. That's putting the kingdom of God and His righteousness first by applying our, uh, conforming our life to to His principles or the principles of God. Now, Paul told us to do that. And we find those words in Romans 12 too. When Paul said, "...and be not conformed to this world..." but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now there's two words in that verse that if you don't understand those two words, you don't understand the verse. They are the words conformed and the words transformed. The word conformed means to fashion oneself to another's pattern. We don't want to fashion ourselves to another's pattern, another being the world. He says to not conform ourselves to the world, not to fashion ourselves to the pattern of the world. But be you transformed. The word transform means to change into another form. Have you ever heard of the word uh, metamorphosis? You learned about that in science. Well, that word metamorphosis, it comes from the same word in the Greek that that word transform comes from. It means metamorphosis. It means literally to be changed into another form. And how does that happen? That happens at the moment of salvation. Well, the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is what? Is he a, is he a, uh, uh, is he a, a, a reformed creature? Is that what the Bible says? No, he's not reformed. He's regenerated. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. What happened to him? He got transformed by the grace of God, forgiving him of his sins through the blood of Christ. And it changes us into another form. So to seek the kingdom of God means to apply those principles to our personal life. It also means to serve His kingdom first. First. Our service unto Him first. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 20, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though Christ did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. We are ambassadors. That's a governmental or a kingdom position. Uh, All of you know what an ambassador is. An ambassador goes to another country and represents the interest of their home country. I guess that they're every country in the world, at least I guess that's uh, friendly with the United States, has an ambassador from the United States in those countries. And most countries that we're friends with, I guess, have an ambassador from their country to us representing their interest. Well, the Bible says that we are ambassadors for Christ. That means that we're serving Christ. Now, now an ambassador 
let's say the ambassador from the United States to uh, Saudi Arabia, just for example, whoever that is. I don't know who that ambassador is. But when he goes over there and meets with the leadership of the Saudi government at different levels from the top down, uh, he's not over there representing his own interest. He's not, he's not supposed to be anyway if he's a good ambassador. He, he's not over there trying to get them to funnel a little money into his bank account or to, to pad his interest or to make his life more comfortable. His job there is to represent the interests of the United States in relation to the country of Saudi Arabia. Well, you and I are ambassadors for Christ. Now, what country do we represent? It's not the United States. Say it out loud. What country do we represent? Heaven. We represent heaven. And we represent the interests of heaven. And as an ambassador for Christ, we, we, we should not be interested uh, in representing our own agenda to a lost and dying world but we're representatives of heaven, of the Lord Jesus Christ, to serve Him in the world today and tell others about Jesus. So we're not only to apply the principles, we're to serve the kingdom first. And it means we're to put His church first. We're to put His church first. That's what it means to seek a God and His righteousness, is to put the church first. Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 3, 5, But if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. That is what we are supposed to put first, is His church. We owe the church. Did you know that? We owe the church our faithful presence. Say amen. You're here. You can... You're here tonight. You can say amen to that. We owe the church our faithful presence. I look at the camera and I say, we owe the church our faithful presence. We also owe the church our faithful participation. Participation in the ministry of the church. We're not supposed to be here to be subscribers only. We're here to be payers as well. And so we owe the church our faithful payments. Keep the lights on. Keep the air conditioning on. How many of you tonight would enjoy the service more if the lights were off and the air conditioning was off? And there was no padding on the pews and no carpet on the floor and you were sitting on a splinter-ridden benches. Oh, we enjoy the padded pews and the carpet. We enjoy the light. and we, we enjoy the air conditioning. Well, somebody has to pay for that, and that's paid for with the tithes of God's people. And so we owe the church our payments. And you know, serving the Lord or seeking God and His righteousness first also means making Christ known to the world first. That's our commission. Jesus gave us out of Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Now, the Bible tells us in this verse, about two things. Seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. I've talked a little bit about that. But then the last part of the verse says, And all these things shall be added unto you. So God rewards, there's a, there's a reward from the Lord for putting Him first. He says, And all these things shall be added unto you. Would you turn with me in your Bibles for just a moment, please, to the book of 1 Kings, chapter number 3. 1 Kings, chapter number 3. And uh, I will begin reading in verse number 5. And I want you to listen very carefully to what the Bible says. We're talking about God's reward for putting Him first. And what I'm about to read to you is a great uh, text or a great example in the Old Testament of the principle that Jesus taught in Matthew 6.33 in the New Testament concerning God's reward for those that put Him first. Alright, are you with me in 1 Kings 3? Alright, look with me in verse 5. 
in Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God asked, God said, Ask what I shall give thee. How, boy, that takes some thought, wouldn't it? God come to you and said, I'll give you anything you want. What do you want? And Solomon said, verse 6, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David my father great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness, that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, O Lord, my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father. And I am but a little child, and I know not how to go in, go out or come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people, that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give therefore, and I hear, here he's going to tell God what he wants, give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this thy so great and the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment, Behold, I have done according to thy words. And lo, I give thee a wise and understanding heart, so that there was none like, like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. And if thou wilt walk in my ways, to keep my statutes and my commandments, as thy father David did walk, then I will lengthen thy days. Now, let me say something here. Keeping in mind that the Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. We see here that God, in verse number 9, uh, heard the request. And the request was Solomon putting God first. He didn't ask for anything for himself personally. But he said, he confessed to the Lord, I'm not able in my flesh, to do this. I'm but a child. I'm immature when it comes to being a king. So I ask you to give me an understanding heart to judge the people, discerning heart, that I may know the difference between good and bad. And the Bible says that it pleased the Lord. And so the request came. God gave him this understanding heart that he would be able to judge the people and discern between good and bad. But I want you to notice in verse number 13, he says, I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor. So there's not another king before you or after you. There'll be nobody like you. All because you put God first. Now, we have to be very careful here and not get the big head and not think that we're somebody and that we have arrived 
Because we put God first and God blessed us and gave us something that we didn't even ask for. He said in the last verse, verse 14, the blessing came along with a warning. If thou wilt walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as thy father David did walk, then, then I will lengthen thy days. With the reward comes the responsibility. I'm going to close the message with this passage of Scripture from Deuteronomy chapter number 11. Verses 26 to 28, here is another example of the blessing of God or the curse of God placed before the people. He says in verse 26 of Deuteronomy 11, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. And he tells you how to obtain either one. A blessing. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day. And a curse, if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which ye have known. We see God's reward is given to those that put God first. Jesus said in the Gospel of John, if you love me, what's that word if? That's a, that's a conditional word, isn't it? If you love me, keep my commandments. And there is a blessing for all who seek God and His righteousness first. All those things that you have need of, God will take care of every one of them. He promises it in His Word. But if we go off to seek other means and other gods, that makes the blessing null and void and it makes the curse applicable. So let's remember as the children of God to put first things first according to the Bible. Let's pray together. May we? Father, thank You for the Word of God tonight and letting us have a little time to look at this passage of Scripture and other Scriptures that drive home the point of what you said on the Sermon, the sermon on the Mount. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We ask you to dismiss us with your grace and give each one traveling grace and mercy home. Continue to be with those that are traveling. Be with those that will be traveling in just a few days on their vacations. And please keep them safe and bring them back as well. We love you and we thank you for all things in Jesus' name.